All right, so I have like a pretty meaty word tonight that I didn't exactly really want to share, but you know, Holy Spirit do does whatever he wants. So, um, so we're going to start out in Acts 16, for those of you who got your Bible. If you don't, just sit by somebody that has one or just listen well. Okay. Um, and then we're going to go into, I think we'll start at verse 16. So 16, 16 in Acts. Um, just look at me when you're there so I know we're all ready to go. I really like when people see the word because then it's better to remember it so you believe that it's there. <laughs> I know sometimes people say things and I'm like, is that really in the word of God? But I want to show you it is. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to be here. Okay, sorry, there's just a piece here. All right, cool. All right. Now, who is familiar, because I don't know how much I need to go into this, who's familiar with the story of where Paul cast the spirit out of the slave girl? Does everyone kind of know, gauge the room? Okay, good. Okay, so I won't go into it too much. I'll make the point. Okay, so now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination, remember that, met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation, and this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and then dragged them to the authorities in the marketplace. Okay. All right. So let's go all super hmm, deep here. Okay. So where it says the spirit of divination, if you look that word up in the Greek, it says python. I'm going to talk to you tonight about the spirit of Python is one of the three things I'm talking about. That's one thing. I came with three messages tonight, so that's one thing. Okay, the spirit of Python is what they're talking about here. Now, this in verse 17 is interesting because it says, that she was crying out, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, if you had someone walk up to you and say, oh, these people are servants of God, and they're great. Like, if someone walked up to, like, Shauna and Dave, and they're like, they're servants of God, they're great, would you immediately th be skeptical of that person? No. You don't want to be skeptical of that person. You'd be like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. They're servants of God. Yeah, that's great. You, but why, was, why did Paul know? Why did Paul know that something wasn't right with this woman? even though she was proclaiming the things of God. What she was saying was true. That's what's even scarier about this when you look at it and you get real deep with it because it's like, wait a minute, you're saying something that's true, but it's not of God. The spirit of Python can say things that are true, but that doesn't mean they are of God. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the false Holy Spirit. So sometimes you could hear things and they could be true, but that doesn't mean it's God who's saying them. Okay? Because, yes, Paul and his men were servants of God, but this is a spirit talking through her. So just because you are with somebody and they are prophetic, or they are whatever, anointed, whatever you want to call it, and they say, you know, something to you that sounds like it's from God, and it might be straight out of the Bible, doesn't mean it's God. Like, God is in this season, he's really strengthening us in this season, and really putting our discernment levels at a higher place, because we really need to be aware of wolves in sheep clothing, if you will. You know, there's going to be people that know the Bible in and out that are going to be preaching, and it's going to sound right. It's all going to sound right, but you're going to get this feeling. You're going to get this, yeah, I know, like, you're saying the things of God. I know, like, that is true, but why do I feel weird around you? Why do I feel like something's off? And I feel like the Lord's saying, Pay attention to those feelings. 
pay attention to that, you know, because it's going to keep you safe. Not everybody is on our team. I hate to say that I wish they all were on our team, but I just have to be true. You know, it's like, so I feel like we just need to be aware of the false Holy Spirit, which is some call it the spirit of divination, some call it Python, whatever you want to call it, the false Holy Spirit, because it's trying to proclaim it is the spirit of God. Now, this happens to the people of God a lot in the prayer closet, and if I'm honest, it's happened to me. You're in the prayer closet, and you see something that is true. Just because it's true doesn't mean it's God's spirit talking to you. You have to test the spirit. Do you feel a peace with that? Do you really feel a peace with that? Is that really the Holy Spirit? Or is it just a spirit talking to you with scripture? You have to discern the difference. You have, we have to come to a place where we're more sensitive, which means we're going to have to be in the prayer closet more because we need to know the tone of his voice, not just things he might say. We need to know the sound, exactly how it is. We need, so we don't have that, we just get off track because some prophet told us something and now we're like way over here because it wasn't actually God. And so it's hard. It's, it's hard. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about one other thing, and then we're going to kind of go through some tips in hearing God, because I want you to make sure that it is God that you're hearing. Because sometimes you're wondering why a, pro a promise in the prayer closet or from a prophet or whatever isn't being fulfilled, and it's quite possible that it never was God. And, and that might be hard to swallow, but we're going to have to go back in the prayer closet and we're going to have to question some things. You know, if this word never came to pass, was it God? Now, sometimes it's our fault. I'm going to be quite honest. Sometimes, we were just talking about this, sometimes our words don't come to pass because of us, because we ain't doing nothing. We're just like, yeah, maybe one day that will happen. One day I'll have an international ministry and it's just going to fall at my feet and... I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be like Joyce Meyer. I'm going to be preaching the gospel, and it's just going to happen. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's not true. So it's just not true. But the same thing. So sometimes it is our fault, and I understand that. I'm not saying that sometimes words aren't coming to pass because we're delaying them, and we're sinning, and we're not doing anything God's telling us to. But sometimes it's just straight up not God. And so we really need to know his voice really well. And so you can't, this is a season to be in the prayer closet. Because I, when I get a promise, I don't want to be believing for something that God never said. Because that is exhausting. You know, when it says hope deferred makes the heart sick. So here I am hoping and waiting for something that's never going to happen. So now my heart has just been sick for years because it was never him at all. And so we have to like, we have to go in the prayer closet. And we have to just make sure that it's God. Okay. So the reason I'm addressing this is because in Mark 16, 17, and if you want to flip there, you can, um, but you guys probably know what this says, but it just talks about some of the signs that we, how we know believers. And one of the signs is it says because they cast out devils. Here we are. And these signs will follow those who believe me in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Now, we know that we're, Christians are known by our love. We know that. Everybody says that Christians will be known by our love. We have those great songs, you know, like, but we don't have, we don't have songs that say Christians will be known because they'll cast out devils. Yeah, we don't, we don't have that. That would be a horrible song. Like, I, I wouldn't like it either. But we have to remember that it also says this, you know, and this is the season for us of authority. This is a season when that thing comes in that you just feel like, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't really feel right. That could have been God, but something feels off. Get out of my prayer closet. No, no, I'm not going to think about it for two seconds because I'm not going to mourn the Holy Spirit for those two seconds where I'm in fantasy land because the spirit of fantasy leads to poverty. That's what it says in Proverbs. The spirit of fantasy leads to poverty. So we can fantasize all we want, but that doesn't get anything done because it wasn't God's word. God's word won't return void, but the spirit of fantasy will, and it wastes our time, and it may wastes our money, and it wastes our efforts. Jesus. 
Okay, so that's one demon I don't want you guys to deal with. So get that out of your prayer closet. Um, and here, how do I know if that's the demon? Sometimes you could ask, and honestly, sometimes they'll actually tell you, just to be honest. Um, and sometimes God will tell you, God, what is like, you know, what is this demon attacking me? He might tell you the name of it. Now, why does that matter? Now, I don't want us to go on a demon hunt. That's not what I'm talking about. Please don't do that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is that we need to be aware. You know, we need to be aware. It shouldn't be the focus. We're supposed to focus on the pure and lovely things, which is Jesus, okay? So it's not in the forefront, but it is here. It is here. Like, we have to be aware. Um, if you think about a boxer, right? When a boxer is going to go into a boxing match, he studies his opponent's tapes. He watches them, and he looks at them. He looks for weaknesses. He looks for how that boxer works. He he meticulously looks into everything, and it's the same with the demonic. We can't just go swelling around, devil, get out of my house anymore. We have to eat the meat, and we have to know what devil is in there, and how did it get in there, and it needs to get out. But we need to be a little more specific, you know, because we're going to see more results as we pinpoint what it is and how it came in, because otherwise you don't know why you keep rebuking the devil, if you can identify what it is, then you can figure out how it got in and you can get it out permanently. Does that make sense? You don't wanna you don't wanna fight the same devil over and over again. If you're gonna fight the devil, fight a new one. You're like, it's just like it's boring. It's boring and it drives us crazy when it's the same kind of devil busting in my prayer closet all the time. So, okay, so here's another kind of devil. We're gonna go into Job 41. Um Da, 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 da. Okay. Now, when I was growing up, I was taught Job really wrong, really, really wrong. I was taught Job did absolutely nothing wrong, and all these things happened to him. And I believed that for a long time. And, at a, and when you look through Job, and you look through it at a baseline, and you just kind of glance through it, you would probably agree with that statement. But as you get deeper into, oh, I'm in Isaiah. What am I doing? How did that happen? I thought I turned to Job. Sorry. Okay, I'm in Job now. Um, okay, so you look at it at a baseline. Job actually did something, but it wasn't when the suffering was going on. It was actually before the suffering was going on. So we're going to address that. Um, so in Job 41, it's, uh, it talks about Leviathan. Now, God... Does everyone know the story of Job, so I don't have to go into all the specific details? Yes, okay. Yeah, all right. So basically, we know that all these horrible things happened to Job, and then we know what happened in the end, and it was all fine and whatever, and Job didn't curse God. But then why does Job repent in, in verse, in chapter 42, if Job didn't do anything wrong? Okay, so, all right, so 41, we talk a lot about Leviathan. Now, I had studied this for a while, trying to figure, because God kept telling me things like, Leviathan is in the prayer closet, and I'm like, all right, Leviathan, get out. <laughs> I don't know, you know, but I, once I started to identify, like, how Leviathan, that spirit, gets into my prayer closet, then I started seeing more breakthrough. Um, if you look in verse 34, it says, he is the king over all the children of pride. So this verse is just a slap in the face sometimes if God brings you here, which he was slapping me in the face because I was in a certain situation. I was being arrogant. But that lets a spirit in, okay? So it says he is the king over all the children of pride. And so if you are prideful, it, he can become the king of you. Now, obviously, Jesus still, still sits on the throne. That's not what I'm saying. But he can control you, and he has access into your life. And the things that he does aren't very good. And it goes into, if you read, if you have time, read through all of Job 41. It's not nice. It's not nice, the things that the Spirit does. Um, you know, it's one of the things, it says in verse 8, it says, Remember the battle, never do it again. And because it's a nasty battle, this spirit is nasty, and it's not easy to get out. Um, actually, 
I wasn't planning on saying this, but in Isaiah 27, the Lord actually is the one to blast out Leviathan in Isaiah 27, for those of you taking notes. So sometimes God will blast out our pride because we can't do it. We can't humble ourselves. So God will put us in a very humble situation so that we get rid of our pride. Okay. It's also, he's also prideful about his appearance. It says this um, in verse 15, his rows of scales are his pride. And so when I think of that, his scales, it's like his outwardly, his outwardly, the things people see on the outwardly, he's prideful about that. Sometimes we're really prideful about the things people can see on the outside, our business, our job, our money, our kids, our ministry, our whatever. We're like, look at me, I'm great. And God is like, you just let in a devil. And maybe he, he, you won't let in a devil if you do that once and you repent, you know. But if you are continuously walking in pride, God is going to deal with you. And you might be like, why are all these horrible things happening to me? And God might be like, repent, repent. In, in Job 42, um, so, so basically Job 41 was all God talking to Job, and then in Job 42, God is talking, or Job is talking to God. Did I switch that? I don't know. But anyway, you see what it says. Then Job answered God. So Job's talking to God in 42. And then he said, so God says all these things to him. He says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be held within, withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I uttered what I did not understand. Because if we remember Job, we know Job is kind of going like on and on and on about just, God, why would you do this to me? God, 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 how could you do this to me? You know, all these things. He's like, check me, God. What have I done? What have I done? Check me, God. Check me, God. And God's like, you're self-righteous. It's not that you're actually doing anything really bad. It's what you think about the fact that you're not doing anything bad you're puffed up. And so God allowed the devil to come in and do his dirty work and humble Job. And it was nasty. And then, so, so Job says in verse six, therefore I might, I abhor, I don't know the word, abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job comes and he repents. And then this is the cool part because this is a really easy thing to get rid of if we just repent of pride because here and then in verse 10 um it says and the lord restored job's losses this is really cool i noticed this when i was praying when he prayed for his friends who had said all this crazy stuff to him they were like job this is why your life is a mess job blah 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 and they just had all these ridiculous reasons probably actually now that i think about it probably operating in the spirit of Python because they're saying all these godly biblical things to Job and none of it's true. None of it's true. And so all of his friends were caught up in the, some Python religious spirit. I don't know what they were caught up in, but it was just like, it, none of it was true. And so, but he just dealt with all of that. And then God says, go pray for your friends. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, you were kicking me when I was down with some lies, okay? I got sores. All these horrible things are happening to me. And now God wants me to go pray for these people. Great. <laughs> you know, and you have that feeling. But the cool thing is when he did, when Job prayed for his friends in verse 10, indeed the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So we find two, three things here that are really important. One, we need to repent of pride if we're having a lot of craziness in our life, chaos, all sorts of stuff, we might need to do a, God, am I being prideful here? Check. Number two, we might need to be praying for our enemies and those people that persecute us. If we're not praying for enemies and the people that persecute us, we might not step into the full deliverance of Leviathan. We might not walk that out. And then the awesome thing is, if you do this, God will restore you double. And so, you know, God shows no partiality. That's one of my favorite verses. God shows no partiality. And so if God would do this for Job, God will do it for you. Now, we're all unique. 
So it, it will look a little differently than everybody else's because what your double is is not my double and whatever, but he will do it. And so I did not want to talk about that tonight. That's not what I like talking about. You guys know I never talk about stuff really, but I just really felt that, like that we need to be aware, but we need to be aware of ourselves too. We need to be in the prayer closet and be like, do I think I'm better than that person? It's like, do I do like when someone's talking about like I'm talking about their life? I'm like, yeah, I just feel so bad for so and so. Their life is just such a mess, you know. They're just kind of like messed up, you know. Like they just need help. They just like need Jesus. And God said, you need Jesus. You need help. Do you forget where I brought you from? Who are you? Who are you? You know. And so I just. I just feel that. Yeah. Cool. Are you guys scared yet? Promise it won't all be like this. <laughs> That's pretty much it. That's the scary part right there. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go into, I felt like five of the tips. Oh, hold on. The Lord's talking to me. Um, Oh, I also, if you, I don't know, maybe this applies to someone here. You can tell me later if you want, if you don't want to tell people. But um, in verse 18, it talks about Leviathan sneezings. Okay, Leviathan sneezings. So if you're like, I don't know why I'm sneezing, it could be pride. I know it sounds weird. It sounds really weird, but just somebody might have needed that. Okay, all right. Now we're going to go into five tips of hearing God's voice. Um, I have a book that I wrote recently with nine tips, but we would be here all night because I normally teach this in three parts. Um, I normally go to someone's event three times, so I'm not going to do that. We're just going to go into the first five um, so we can kind of walk through some tips because I want to make sure you guys are hearing God. That's what I really want to make sure because, like, those things will manifest. If you steward the things God tells you, those will manifest. I don't want you to have empty promises. It stinks. I've experienced that really hard. Like I, you know, and Shauna walking me through this mess, but like, you know, there's like, there was things in my life that I was really hoping for, but nothing came to happen. And I was like, and I just kept interceding and I just kept praying and I just kept hoping. And, and finally it was just like the door just shut and I just didn't understand it. And I had to get some, and it was through my pain that God really taught me how to hear him really well. You know, people might look at me and they might say, okay, so holy, she can hear the Holy Spirit really well. It's pain that brought me here. It's pain. It's from making some stupid, stupid mistakes that put me on my face and said, Lord, I, I don't even know how to hear you anymore. I don't even know because I really, really thought this was you, but it really, really wasn't you. And so I don't trust myself. I don't even know if I can hear you. I don't know, you know? And I just, I came to that point and I was just broken. And I went into like a three-month depressive hole and I refused to prophesy over anyone. I was just like, I'm not prophesying over nobody. I don't even know if I, if I can't hear God for me, I shouldn't be hearing God for anybody else, you know? And I just was like, I'm done. I'm done. That's not right, you know? And so for three months, I just walked around like a zombie, like, oh, my life sucks. I don't know why. Oh, you know, and I did that for like three months until finally one day I just like I got to be alone and for a little while and um, I just kind of like was crying, you know, and I was just like, Lord, like, OK, I, I, I admit that I know that you talk. OK, your Bible says all the time, like the Lord spoke, the Lord spoke, you know, and so we see that 100 million times in the Bible. But it's like, not really. I'm exaggerating for those of you like calculators over there. That's wrong. But, you know, anyway, <laughs> but it's like, but I don't know how I know that I know that it's you. I got some ideas. I got some little ideas that I like to throw in there, but I really don't know. And then the Lord started speaking to me tips on hearing him. He started like downloading all these things. And then I became really accurate 
I became, I stopped going like all over the place all the time. It was just like, well, I'm on one stream. I'm over here. I don't know. I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm going on this mission trip. Just not, just kidding. That wasn't God. And I was just making like mistakes left and right. And just, but sometimes I was getting it really right. You know, sometimes I was like, oh yeah, that was Jesus. You know, but sometimes I was really wrong. And and I needed to be humbled. I needed to know that I could not figure out how to hear God on my own. I needed God to, like a baby, go, let me tell you how to hear God. <laughs> because you cannot figure it out. I have to be the one that teaches you. And so these are some of the things that, and he taught these to me, and I, I've been sharing them everywhere I go. I, I've like I've probably done, I don't know, you can ask my husband, 20, 25, 30 events just on all this stuff. Like, because this is the, one of the most common questions I get after who's going to marry, who am I going to marry, Kay? That's my number one question. But the second question, <laughs> people are always asking me that stuff. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and if God told me, would I really tell you? What if I was wrong? Like, oh, it would be bad. But it's just like, but, you know, the second question is, Kay, do you think this is God? Do you think what I'm doing right now is God? Do you think this is God? And, and I want to just, like, give that back to everybody. I want to say, let me tell you how, let me teach you how to hear God, and then let me give you a little, a little tricycle with some training wheels. I'll be, I'll be the training wheels tonight, but then after you leave, you have to take the training wheels off, and you have to try it yourself. Because I want to point you back into the Father. I want, you, I want to say, hey, let me give you some tips because I've been there. But you have to spend the time in the prayer closet. You have to be with him, beloved. And you have to sit and cry and work this out till you know that you know that you know him. Okay. That's a big intro. Okay. Um, Jeremiah 29, 13. This is going to be tip one for those of you that like to take notes. Um, tip one is reach. Um, and... Jeremiah 29, 13. I got so many tabs in here. I'm supposed to talk about so many things. Hold on, let me get to that. 29, 13. Okay. And you will seek me and find me when you search me, search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. Now, most of the time, we... No, we know that verse. Does anyone not know that verse? It's very like, I'll seek God and I'm going to find him and that's great. But it says, with your whole heart. Now, if we want to do this prayer closet thing, we're probably not going to hear him right. I'm just going to run into the prayer closet. God, what'd you say? <laughs> okay. And we run out and we hear wrong. We hear wrong when we do that. We have to become surrendered to hear really well. We have to be in a place of God. Anything you want to do, anything you want to say, I'm open. I'm open. I'm open. Because sometimes you're coming in there wanting to talk about something, and God don't even want to talk to you about that. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? You're like, God, what about this bill that needs to be paid tomorrow? He's like, actually, can you go pray for that person over there? And you're like, oh, you're not listening to me. But the only reason you can hear a statement like that is if you can get over yourself enough to hear him. You can't, you got to, you got to take everything that's going on in your whole life and you just got to put it on the altar daily and say, whatever you want to say to me, whatever you want me to do, the surrendered hearts brings about so much fruit, so much fruit, so much fruit. And so that's really what Jeremiah 29, 13 is talking about. We reach after God. We reach, we go after him. Um, now, yeah, there's some times where I'm walking around and the Holy Spirit just goes, Hey, Kay, do this, you know, whatever. Yeah, that happens too. But that's not like, that's not always the bigger, bigger things. You know, sometimes it is. Sometimes you'll hear a big word, in it, but then you need to go back in the prayer closet and double check that word. Hold on. Let me make sure all idols, God, all idols. Let's make sure. Let's make sure. Um, something that I've learned is that if I will identify what my possible idol is, I'll often hear him better. So if I know myself, it's really about knowing yourself. Because if I can say, this is probably what I would want to do in this situation, and I can put that probably what I want to do on the altar, then I can really receive what God wants to say to me. But it's in those moments where I am like going like this that I just don't even know what's going on. 
And then I'm, and then I'm texting people and typing to people and I'm like, I'm so confused. What's God saying? I have no idea. And God's like, what is your, what is your like idol here? What is the thing that you're not getting lower? Oh, ah. You're not allowing out of your heart because it makes your heart go like this. You know, you're like, you feel like this in the prayer closet. God, I just, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. What idol is in there? And it might even be a good idol. I know it sounds weird. That sounds bad. But like in, in the sense that you really love your friend and you really want this thing to happen for them, you know? You really love your husband or you really love your job and you want certain things. And it's not that those things are bad. They're not bad. But they just have to come below God. You just can't be obsessing about them and thinking about them so much that you don't allow God to just speak to you. Huh. Okay. Um, the word there, actually, I didn't write this down, but I guess we're going there for a second. The word where it says, when you search me for all your heart, um, the word's actually labab, and it's, um, it's a really complex word. There's actually like nine different translations of the word, and I probably said that wrong. I don't know if I did, but Anyway, I'm not that great with uh, stuff like that. But anyway, um, when you break it all down, it really goes into all the different areas of our heart. It goes, what is the, like it goes past culture, past economics, past current situations, past emotions, past all these things. And sometimes we have to identify, am I thinking this is what to do because of the culture that I'm in? Am I thinking that this is what I'm supposed to do because of the finances Am I thinking that this is what I'm supposed to do because of my, my relationships in my community and that's probably what they would want me to do? You know, there's been times where I've had seriously everyone in my community tell me something and they were all wrong. Like every single one of them was all wrong. Because all of them, their hearts were so emotional for the same thing because they're in the same community that all of their hearts were an idol. And I just had to be like, uh, I don't think that's right. But, you know, I just quiet myself, you know. Um, but, yeah, there's times I've been wrong, too. So, you know, we just have to do that. Okay. And, oh, another one I feel like the Lord's having is natural knowledge. Past, one of the definitions is nat, past natural knowledge. So it's like, oh, it would make sense to buy this building because this building says that, like, we, we have the money for it. But what if God said to buy this building and you don't have the money for it? But what if he knows something that you don't know that so-and-so is going to do something tomorrow and you're not going to have to pay for it at all, but you just had to walk through that door? You know, sometimes you don't know. You know, I've had times like that where I'm like, this makes no sense at all. Like, this is dumb. Like, if I told my friends what this is, they would say that I'm dumb. Like, that's what they would. They would be like, so sometimes, like, when I'm believing for something big or I'm doing something weird, I don't tell nobody. I'm just, like, in the prayer closet, like, I'm not even going to talk about this with people because I don't want to hear what they think is a good idea. I want to hear what God is saying, you know? And it's important some, to get people around you, like, that you can say, hey, like, do you think God is saying this? No, don't tell me your opinion. I don't really care. Don't, I don't care what your opinion is. I need to know what God is saying. That's what I need to know because that is going to produce my harvest. And I want my harvest. I don't want an opinion stopping me from my harvest. And when I get opinions that I didn't ask for, because that's going to happen, and we all know that. <laughs> when I get opinions that I didn't ask for, I can then say, I then say, thank you and I just walk away. I don't agree to the opinion, you know? It's like, we can't let people pleasing stop us from the real harvest. We have to become more secure in, I know God spoke to me, and I'm not doing that. And if they're coming at you, well, that doesn't make sense, and you shouldn't be doing that, and blah, 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 blah. Does that really sound like God? You know, sometimes I believe with my girlfriends for stuff that I'm not even sure if it's God, but I'd rather believe crazy with them. That's where I'd rather make my mistakes in faith then I make my mistake sitting in a scared little box for the rest of my life, hoping that nothing bad happens to me. Faith is messy. You're going to make some mistakes sometimes. But when you make mistakes and you hit those lows and he humbles you like Job, he's gonna, you're going to hear him really well because you're going to need him. And when you need him, you hear him really well because you run back into the prayer closet when you need him. Oh, God! You know, you run back in there. And so... Yeah, we have to reach past him 
in everything. Um, another verse is Luke twenty two forty two. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Well, God wasn't willing to take Jesus' cup. You know, sometimes we're interceding for stuff that God just wants to do. Like he, we're, God, please don't do this. I want to cause this. And Isaiah, it says, I cause peace and I cause calamity. Sometimes God is causing the calamity because he's bringing you to somewhere you could have never gone if you stayed here. I just feel something with that in the room. There's some, there's a couple of you that I see, like, it's just like, okay, like God caused the calamity. Okay. God can cause calamity. You're like, this doesn't make any sense. I was a good employee. I was a good ministry person. I was doing everything I could. Why did I get kicked out? Why did they say that to me? I can't believe this. God turned Pharaoh's heart. Remember God turned Pharaoh's heart. But God, also, like we were talking earlier, turned Lydia's heart. So God turned Pharaoh's heart in a negative way. You know, when, when they were approaching him, he made it hard so they would have to leave Egypt, right? He made Pharaoh's heart's hard. But with Lydia, God softened her heart, you know? So God brings peace and God brings calamity. And sometimes you got to say, thank you for the calamity because something better is coming because you just pushed me out of this junk, okay? <laughs> and there's always something better. Like, you can't really honestly think wherever you were was the best in your whole life. Maybe it was for a season, but you don't think it can get better? It's going to get better. Praise God. Okay. Um, another thing is you need to be journaling all the time. All the time. I had to say you need to do this, but you need to do this. Because you need to know yourself. And you need to know God. If you're not, like, journaling, like, what you think God's saying, first of all, you're not even going to remember it. I don't, oh, God said something. I don't really know what he said. You need to be able to go back and see what exactly did he say. Because sometimes when I go back and I see the exact phrase that he said, I was like, man, I kind of over-exaggerated that thought. You're like, I will provide for you. And I think in my head, you're going to give me a million dollars. Oh, yes, God, yes. He's like, no, no, I said I'd provide for you. That's what I told you, didn't I? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, you know, and so we have to be able to go back and just get in that habit um, and just test what we thought. Did it happen? Did it happen, you know? And obviously some things we'll never see happen, right? Like Isaiah, he never saw that stuff happen, most of it. He never got to see it. There's... There, oh, I just feel the Holy Spirit. There's someone in here right now where it's like you prophesied something and you might never get to see it happen, but that doesn't mean it's not God. It doesn't mean God's not going to do it, you know? So you can't, some things are not for our lifetime. We're prophesying for the generation. We're prophesying for the future, our grandchildren, their grand-grandchildren, whatever. It's like, it's not even about our ministry. It's not even about us. It's about who we're going to get to leave it to, you know? Because I don't know. Oh, Jesus. Hmm. Hmm. Sharon, I just feel a Lord on you. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Ha. Huh. Hmm. I feel there's been like a demonic spirit that's like I saw it around your like chest. And I feel like there's been this feeling of like choking. Yeah? Okay. Can I pray for you? Okay. Lord, we just pray against that spirit. We bind that spirit in the name of Jesus, God, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, give her a fresh anointing, God, a fresh anointing. We just break everything off that isn't you in Jesus' name. And we say, go back to hell where you came from. Sharon is yours, and she is safe, and she is a daughter of the king. We claim her over here. Do not touch her in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, get off. Get off of her in Jesus' name. Yeah, I, I hear that word calamity with you right now. I feel like there's like he's um, pulling you out. There's a weeding process going on. He's, there's heart healing that's going on. There's discernment that's increasing in the process of all this. There's people you trusted that you can't really trust anymore. And I felt the Lord said, good. And he said, I have something so much more for you, Sharon. Hmm. I saw you with a worldwide women's ministry and I saw what I saw is I saw like this um what is that thing called it's like a 
God, give me a word here. I just, it's like a ruler, but it's not a ruler because you can wrap it around you. A tape measure? Okay, sorry. A tape measure um, around you, and there was like, it, I heard the word fit, and it was like, I don't know. There was just exercise and fit and personal development and, and psychological. It was like you were combining the psychological with like the fit. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also saw you were bringing people out of poverty. I saw you had a financial anointing on your life and you were giving very practical tips on how to, I saw Dave Ramsey. Um, I saw like getting people out of debt um, and consolidating things and like just moving towards financial freedom. And I felt the Lord said, keep walking in that. Like that is an area of pulling people out of poverty that he really wants you to focus on. Um, because I heard it's going to be like rapid fire. It's going to be like you're getting someone out of poverty and they like share their testimony and then like three other people do just because of that testimony because we overcome with the testimony. Yeah, Jesus, huh? <laughs> Jesus. What's your name? Christina? Christina. Hmm. Yeah, I heard the word battle. I feel like there's been a battle over your mind, and there's been, like, confusion and chaos. Is that true? I just feel like the Lord said, be still, he's fighting for you. Yeah. Hmm. And I saw your heart, and it was like as if it was two hearts, like it was in half. Um, and I saw like this person, and they just like stepped on your heart. Um, and it was rough. It was ugly. It was ugly what they did. And the Lord said, like He's gonna redeem you a hundredfold. Like there's like, and I heard the word a hundred like again because He wanted to emphasize that. Like yeah. Jesus. And I saw an umbrella go over you and the Lord and you were under the umbrella and he said, I'm protecting you through the storm. Yeah. Mm. I heard opportunities are coming. Um, and I saw you trying to open this door and be like, why won't this open? Um, and I felt the door said, I'm kicking the door open. You cannot open these doors. And I saw the Lord go, and he blew on the door and it opened. And you're like, uh, I don't know if this is what I want. And the Lord said, you have to keep going. You have to keep going. I feel like there's going to be a breakthrough that you get when you first get it. You're not sure if you want it, but the Lord said, keep going. Jesus, it's going to look different this time, different way. Yeah. And I heard the word Ruby, like, um, in Proverbs 31, it talks about how a woman is worth more than rubies. And I feel like there's a self-value thing going on where the Lord wants to increase your self-value. Because I saw you coaching women in self-value and insecurity, and I feel like there's an attack on that with you because there's a heart to do that. And so sometimes it can feel really intense. But the Lord says as you reach out and as you help people, like it's actually going to help you and it's going to feed back to you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. All right. Back to our teaching. <laughs> uh, okay. So the second tip on hearing God is receive. What do we need to receive? We need to receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. It makes it a whole lot easier to hear God. Okay. Like if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, that makes it a lot easier because it's always with you. So you could be walking around and be like, yo, Holy Spirit, what's up? You don't have to think that God is out there far some way like he is inside of you. He's inside of you. And so if you're hearing like all this craziness out here, it's probably, probably not God. Like it, it could be, but probably not because the devil comes at us like that. Like I'll often, like he gets up in my face or something. He's like, what are you, are you sure you're going to do that? You still want to do that? Did God really say that? You know, and he's like, in my face. Or sometimes he's attacking in my chest, you know, and trying to cut off my circulation. I'm like, oh, well, why don't you just kill yourself or something crazy like that that he says. And I'm just like, get out of here. It's ridiculous, you know. And so it's just like, but it's like inside of us, okay? Like inside of us. Like if you've already received the Holy Spirit, this should be in there. If not, receive it in faith now <laughs> in Jesus' name. And don't doubt you received this. I hear this all the time. People constantly say, I don't know. Do I have the Holy Spirit? I'm not really sure. I don't know. I don't know. Well, 
You do if you believe that you have it because it says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind and receives nothing from God. So if you stop questioning if you receive the Holy Spirit, if you already receive the Holy Spirit, number one, because that's a waste of your mental energy and that's just the devil trying to get you all over the place. Okay, I have the Holy Spirit within me. Now what do you want to say, God? You know, because he always, the devil always wants to question our salvation and our spiritual gifts and all that. Are you sure you're prophetic? Are you sure you're an evangelist? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you probably are if you're hearing a statement like that. Like, why would he come at you in that area? That must mean that I am. Oh, thank you for telling me. Yay. Jesus. So we have to receive the Holy Spirit. The question is, if it's the real Holy Spirit. Ah! Okay. We can receive false Holy Spirits. We can. It's scary to say that, but we can. And that's what I was talking about earlier. I was talking about the spirit of Python, the false Holy Spirit. It's proclaiming the things of God, but it's not actually the real Holy Spirit. Um, now, some people can have the real Holy Spirit and the false Holy Spirit at the exact same time. And that makes you insane. <laughs> it does, because you're like, I heard Jesus. Wait, that ain't Jesus. I heard Jesus. I, oh, you know? And so just because if you're feeling a demonic false Holy Spirit doesn't mean you don't have the real one in you as well. It might mean that Python is a snake, right? So Python might wrap itself around you, but that doesn't mean if you don't unwrap it, you're going to hear the Holy Spirit. You will. You just got to learn how to unwrap it. And so you can hear him. Um, okay. Now, this is one of my favorite verses because it saved my life. <laughs> and I don't say that um, very lightly. Um, I, I mean it. Um, okay, let's go into uh, 1 John. Let me just, I need like a giant desk sometimes. Okay, sorry. I just like have so many. This was like one of those things where I'm like, God, you want to say all these things to them? No. I'm like, that's a lot of things. It's like, yep, I know. I'm like, okay, great. Um, so, <laughs> yep. All right. So, First John, it's right before Revelations. For it's not not John. First John. Um, so, First John four one through let's say three ish. We'll say that. Um, so, First John four one through three. Um, I love that John wrote this. I'm just going to start off by that. I love that John wrote this because John is the beloved. So if someone was going to know the deeper things and know the voice of God, it was going to be John. Because John is like all up on Jesus, like, hey, Jesus. And he's going to be the one that would hear him. So it's really cool that he would write the thing about discerning the spirits in the Bible. So I just think that's cool. Um, so be like John, in other words. Okay. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay, so first thing it says is test the spirits. So we are supposed to test the things that are coming to this. Now, some of you, you who know me, I, this might be repetitive, but I felt like I was supposed to share it anyway, so I apologize, but I'm sharing it anyway. Because somebody doesn't know this, and they need to hear it. Um, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Okay, so let's break down verse two. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit... Okay, so that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, um, is of God. Okay, so if you're in the prayer closet, and you're like, you think you hear a voice, and you don't know if it's God, or you, or the devil, or whatever, you can speak to that voice, and you can say, like, has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And that voice should say, yes, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. If that voice does not respond, yes, get it out of there now, <laughs> okay? It's not God. Because what it says in the next verse, it says, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. It's very simple, but it's profound if you really think about it. It's going to help you clear things up in the prayer closet. 
And that doesn't mean think, yes, Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh. I could do whatever I want now. That's not what I'm saying. Like actually seek God and, 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 and wait, you know, I'm hearing a voice. Let me speak to that voice. Um, so this is really cool. The only other person I know that actually goes around teaching all this is a couple of people in Orlando and uh, Smith Wigglesworth teaches on this too. So um, what is that book called, Ryan? Oh, sorry, I put him on the spot. My bad. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, Smith Wigglesworth teaches on this, and I think that's a pretty good uh, reference there because he should know what he's talking about because he definitely heard God. Um, the fruit of his tree is obviously good. Okay. So, all right. So, does that is that helpful to people? There's some tips right there. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay, number three, and I did this all in R's because the Holy Spirit downloaded in R's because we have to remember things in an easy way because we're kids. <laughs> okay, so number three is repent. Um, and when I say repent, uh, our, immediate go, our immediate gut reaction goes, ugh, ugh, repentance, oh God, no, I don't want to repent, I don't want to, da, 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 da. That was a great voice, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> Our, our, that's our immediate reaction to repentance. But, like, re God spoke to me so clearly once, and he said, repentance is love. And I said, what do you mean repentance is love? Like, that is not loving. I'm like, oh, stink, God, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. And God said, no, you're doing this all wrong. He said, repentance is, not, is, is choosing love again. So when we sin, we do one of three things. We don't love ourselves, we don't love God, or we don't love other people. If we step back into love, we've immediately repented. You know, you think of like a heroin addict or something. If they're, they're like, oh, well, I need to repent of doing heroin or something, they're not loving themselves, right? They're not loving themselves, so they need to repent of that. They need to repent of not loving their family because chances are they've spent their family's money or they've hurt their family emotionally or something like that. And they're not loving God because God has to watch their son or daughter suffer. And he has to look at them and be like, man, like, oh, I have this plan for you, but you're like distorting it over here, you know? And, but the great thing is we just have to choose love again. That's it because God is love. And so when we choose to love ourselves, love others and love God, when you choose back into love, you can stop repenting and you can decide that you've repented enough, okay? So, because repentance sometimes is an action. It's not saying, God, I'm sorry, I did it again. I'm sorry, I did it again. I'm sorry, I did it again. I'm sorry, I did this again. That's not actually repentance. That's you saying you're sorry. And that's okay. That's not an invalid thought, but that's not repentance. Repentance is actually changing what you're doing, you know? It's actually changing, you know? And so, like, I don't know. You have to just be like, am I actually ch trying to change this or am I just trying to say I'm sorry so God isn't mad at me? We need to try to change things. Now, why does, what does this have to do with hearing God? Your heart is loud when you're in sin. Your heart is loud. Your heart is like, la, 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 I'm doing this. La, 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 la. And you, it's not that God isn't talking to you. It's that you can't hear him because your heart is so loud. Because out of the heart flows the issues of life, right? And so I have all, I can't, I hear all this stuff in the prayer closet. And I don't know, I hear so many different things. Why do you hear all those things? Maybe you need to like repent of something, you know? So don't, don't go on a crazy thing trying to figure out what it is, okay? Just ask God what it is, okay? Don't go repenting for something that happened 27 years ago again, okay? It's over. Like ask God, show me what I need to change in my life. Sometimes change is a better word. Show me what I need to change in my life to calm my heart down so I can hear you better. Because something has made you out of step with the Holy Spirit, you know? And it might not be something that seemed as a big sin. It might not be like sexual immorality or something like deeper like that. It might be like, hey, I told you not to hang out with the person anymore and you keep doing it. You know, and because the Bible says, whatever man knows to do good and does not do it, that to him is sin. And so if God has told you some good thing to do, like I told you to bless this person. Hello. Hello. And you're like, I don't know why I can't hear God. And he's like, I already talked to you. You need to go do that and then come talk to me. 
You know, because it will, it's not because he doesn't want to talk to you still. It's because your heart is not calm and you can't hear him. And so it calms your heart down when you choose back into love. Okay? So don't freak out when God tells you to repent. Just love. Okay. Um, this is another good verse. I love this verse. This is um, in Genesis 3, 8. Um, I didn't mark this, so I'm probably going to be looking for it. Genesis 3, 8, and it's talking about Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, and it's right after they, like, make a giant mess, basically. Is this it? Um, okay, so 3, 8. Okay, so we know the story of Adam and Eve. We know that they sinned, and they ate the thing they weren't supposed to, and they covered themselves up with fig leaves, and we know all that. Okay, but... What we can glean from this today is in verse 8, because right now here, where we're at in the story right now is where God and, um, sorry, they had just sinned and they're trying to cover themselves up in the fig leaves. That's where we're at. And so the next verse, it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? And I love this because God is looking for them in their sin. God is still after them. God is, God, you know, I hear this so many times. Like people say, well, if you sin, you know, you got to get yourself together and then God will talk to you. And I'm like, God's looking for you. You just, God's still looking for you. And if you can get your heart quiet, you can still hear him even when you're sinning. Because he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's there. He's there. Stop questioning it. Your sin isn't that big anyway. It's already done with. So just go change whatever it is and move on. Don't, don't sit in there and beat yourself up and let the devil tell you how horrible you are all day long. That doesn't help you hear God. Like, God, I know I messed up. I'm going to change that. I'm going to be different. Let me receive your grace and your forgiveness in a tangible way because it's not that it's already been there. It's just that you need to feel it again. You just need to feel it. It's not that it's not there. Um, hmm. Okay. I feel like I'm going to go out of order, but that's okay. Um, normally I go number four and number five, but we're going to go number five because I feel the Holy Spirit switching. Um, number five, which should be number four or whatever, um, is restore. And this is what would be, oh, yeah, that's why we're going into this, because I started talking about that. Okay. Restore is just basically making sure your heart is quiet, but in a tangible way. Because sometimes it's things that are currently going on in your life that are causing your heart to be loud. And sometimes it's things from your past that are causing your heart to be loud. And that's what I'm talking about, restore. Because sometimes something happened in your past, and your heart is still loud about it because you never dealt with it. You can try to avoid it all that you want and be like, I don't want to talk about that. I'm good, God. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. You are so good. And then you're like, oh, I just feel like garbage. I don't know what's going on. And God's like, when are you going to talk to me about that thing that happened when you were a kid? When are we going to actually have a conversation about that? When are we going to talk about that bankruptcy that you went through? When are we going to talk about that abuse? When are we going to talk about that stuff? Because when you don't talk about it, it's not that God doesn't know. Of course God knows. You haven't mourned it out. You got to mourn that junk out. You got to cry it out. Get it out. Get it out of your system. Just get it out. Because mourning brings joy. But sometimes if you don't tap into the mourning, you don't get the joy. There's times where I'm like, God's like, okay, we need to deal with this thing that happened. And I'm like, I don't want to deal with it. But I don't know why I'm in a funk. It's because I haven't mourned. We have to allow ourselves to mourn. And the Bible says mourn when others mourn. He wouldn't say that if you're not supposed to mourn. Like, you need to mourn. You know, you need to sit with people and allow them. You know, I'm a prophetic life coach, and I have girls crying in my living room all the time. That's basically my job. <laughs> I'm mourning with girls. They're just crying on the floor or something like that. But it's just like, but it, it heals them because it's an area of their heart that hasn't been addressed. It's an area of their heart that is loud. It's God. I, I, I didn't feel good when that happened. I didn't like it. And it, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. God cares more about you than it's just okay. 
He wants to talk to you about it. He wants to be intimate. He wants to sit with you. He wants you to cry in his arms. Because other times we go on what I would call false mourning. You know, so-and-so's, you know, and I'm not lessening death because my grandma just died this year, but it's like sometimes people will take a death and they will drag the mourning out for like basically their whole life. They're just like, oh, you know, so sad that they died. And they're still really upset about it. And it's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with missing someone. That's not what I'm saying. There's a difference between missing someone and not mourning, you know, because there's an emotional sting to it that you feel. Because you never let it out. You never allowed yourself time to process, time to think, you know? Sometimes you need to journal, God, I really don't like that so-and-so died, you know? I really don't like that so-and-so whatever. This hurts. But when you allow yourself, I, I schedule mourning when big things happen. That sounds like crazy, but I do. I'm like, you know, when my grandma died, I'm like, I'm taking two days to just cry this out, and I'm doing nothing else but that. That's it. I'm, that's all I'm doing for two days. I'm just going to let myself cry and mourn this and really feel it and think about it and just let it go. And then when I came out, it wasn't as hard anymore. It was like, you know what? God, praise you that she's with you. Praise you that she's with you. I'm happy. I rejoice, you know? And so it's like, but I had to allow myself space. You know, and whatever that is, I don't know if the Lord's bringing something to your heart right now, but take note of that. And when you go home tonight or tomorrow or this week or whenever you have time in the prayer closet, go talk about that stuff with him. God, I know you and I have never talked about this before because I don't want to talk about it because it's the past. But my, one of my mentors said to me, she said, you're, you're dwelling in the past by not dealing with it. So stop saying, I don't want to dwell in the past. You're not dealing with it. So you are dwelling in the past because those lies are circling around you. They're just circling around you over and over again. And so you are dwelling in it because they possess your mind. Oh, I don't deserve anything. I'm just a victim. Oh, life is too hard for me. Oh, I have all these problems. Oh, nobody likes me. Da -da -da -da. And it's just circling your mind. And if you just go cry it out for a couple days and just go do that. Now, don't do that before you got to go to work in an hour, okay? Because I've done that stupidly. I'm like, oh, God, my past, and then I got to go work, and they're like, what is wrong with you, you know? Don't do that. Like, actually make the time for it. Actually, like, say, hey, these two hours, like, tonight, you know, when I got a couple hours, I'm just going to sit with God and get all this stuff out. Um, so, and just asking him where he was in a moment is really important, too. Like, because sometimes we don't know, like, like how he could have let this happen, whatever it is. And there's something about when you hear the Lord's voice for a moment, you hear the Lord's voice for that specific moment. You know, when the Lord spoke to me about my father dying and he was just like, I let him die because like, I didn't want him to abuse you. That was really hard for me to hear. But it showed me that God was my protector and that, that there was purpose in my pain. It hurt. But there was purpose. And there's something about when the Holy Spirit speaks to it. Your girlfriend could tell you, it's okay, God works all things together for good, and you believe that. But when the Holy Spirit speaks intimately to you about your problem, there's a break. There's a break. And, and that's what helps in the prayer closet. Get this stuff out. And if you don't know what's in there, just ask God, is there anything in there? Because I don't want you going digging and going driving yourself nuts. That's not what I'm trying to do. Just, God, is there anything in there? If there is, get it out. Okay, and the last tip of the night, and then we're going to have some prophetic fun because that's what I like doing. <laughs> um, the last tip is to act, is called reject or red, whichever one you want to call it. Get the demons out of the prayer closet, okay? Get them out. Reject them from the prayer closet. So if you're in there and something says to you, like, no, Jesus Christ doesn't come in the flesh, get out goodbye, bind you, da -da 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 -da. sometime, and this is especially for the women in the room, sometimes we don't like to be vocal because we were victims and we're not sure that we can talk. So we'll be all quiet being, maybe if I just say nothing, the demons will just go away. Maybe if I just like, you know, I don't know, God, hopefully you come. I don't know. And God's saying, I've given you the power to tread on scorpions. 
You have to rebuke these things. You have the power to rebuke them. Because what does that do? How does that help you hear God? It gets rid of the noise in your head. So now we've gotten rid of the noise in your heart. Now we're getting rid of the noise in your head. Now we're getting rid of all what's wrong in your heart. And now you're really going to be able to hear him well. You're really going to be able to, because you know what all that is? It's you and the devil getting out of the way. So you can just receive, <laughs> so you can just receive him. Does that make sense? Does everyone get that? I know there's a lot of information, but I just, I guess like, so here's the tips. Reach after God, receive the Holy Spirit, repent, reject the demons, and restore your heart, and get rid of Leviathan, which is basically pride, and get rid of Python, which is false images that are proclaiming to be Jesus. I mean, there's, you can be in the prayer closet and a vision could say to you, I am Jesus and it's not Jesus. That's scary when I say that out loud, but that's true. When we were in, when I was doing ministry school, there was girls coming in, they're like, Jesus told me to do this. I was like, well, tell me about it. And they were like, telling me these visions of Jesus coming in and it wasn't Jesus. How do you think cults start? You know what I mean? How do you think this stuff starts? Because they're like, I heard God tell me this. Yeah, you heard a demon posing as God to tell you something. And now a whole false religion exists. How do you think the Mormon started? You know, with Muhammad, he said, oh, I saw an angel. He saw a false angel, probably. Maybe his story isn't wrong. Maybe it's just the wrong kind of angel. Maybe it's a fallen angel. You know, and so it's like we have to speak to these things. Has Jesus Christ come in flesh? Who sent you? Who are you from? You know, we have to be diligent so we don't get deceived. You know, it's like I, it's like you can be in a really, you know, a spiritual community, and that's some of the scariest places sometimes because we just, we want a spiritual encounter so bad that we'll take anything. We'll take anything. And it's like we have to speak to those things. Are you of the Lord? Who are you? Who are you talking to me? And you can speak directly to the vision. Oh, what do I do? Vision? Where are you coming from? Speak to it. Voice around this area? Where are you coming from? Speak to it. You know? And you'll find that the still, quiet voice is him. You'll find that past all of this stuff. All right, I'm going to pray that this stays in your head. Um, and, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll pray, and then... Um, We'll do some prophetic stuff. Oh, I don't know what time it is. Not, oh, sorry. It's kind of late. Sorry about that. Ah, oh, Jesus, we thank you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that you want us to hear you. It's not that you don't want us to hear you, God. God, calm our hearts. Calm our mind. Rid us of the distraction. I saw somebody with a cell phone. Somebody, I saw it crack. Somebody get rid of your phone. <laughs> Get rid of the iPad, get rid of all that stuff. Just put it out in a different room, God, and just, Lord, help us get over the family distractions and all the family drama, Lord. Help us get over the finances and all the things going up and down with that. Help us put all of our careers and wants and ministries and businesses on the altar. God, help us put everything on the altar, Lord, that we can just hear you clearly. God, we just want to hear you, God. God, we just want to know, God, if we knew, God, God, if we knew, God, we would listen, God. God, if we knew, we would listen. I silence every devil talking to your mind in the name of Jesus. I bind you and cast you out. I pray for a supernatural manifestation of heart healing right now. God, as you're sitting there and praying, God, I pray that people are hearing you right now. God, speak to your children, Lord. Speak to your children, whether it's one word or a sentence or a couple words, Lord. Just speak to your children. They can hear you. They can hear you. There's someone here. You can hear him. You can hear him. How does he call fear of the unknown in Jesus' name? You don't have to be afraid of his voice. He's not your father. Jesus. He's better. He's perfect. He's holy. He's pure. And yeah, you're not good enough, but nobody is. Come to the throne. Jesus was good enough for you. Jesus, help us know that we're blameless before the throne of God. God, we're blameless before you, Lord. 